Good afternoon. My name is Luis Carlos Cobo. I lead the WaveNet team uh, at DeepMind for Google in Mountain View, and I oversaw and worked on launching WaveNet for the Google Assistant first in October last year, uh, and that was also launched to cloud uh, later. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is WaveNet, how it works, uh, why it is better than previous approaches for text-to-speech, um, and a little bit of um, you know, how it compares with the, with the, with the other methods. Um, so before we had WaveNet, there were uh, the previous approaches to text-to-speech basically fall on two categories. Uh, the, usually, the highest quality one was concatenative. And in this type of uh, text-to-speech approaches, we take a large corpus of uh, speech from one speaker, and we divide it on small slices of a, free mi of, of a few microseconds, or sorry, mi milliseconds. And then the problem of text-to-speech is just a problem of finding the right pieces of speech to reconstruct what you want to say. Um, on the other hand, uh, with parametric approaches, uh, we build, we have a linguist build a model uh, or a mathematical function that approximates uh, how the vo human vocal tract works. And then we learn, sometimes maybe using machine learning, how to drive that model uh, to be able to say the things that we want to say and to resemble the speaker that we want to match. So both approaches have come a long way, and they, they, they are good for uh, many applications, but they have some limits. Uh, in, for concatenative methods, the main issue is the amount of data that you need to, for it to sound good. Uh, you need several dozen hours of, of data so that you have enough pieces to reconstruct anything that you might uh, want to say. If you don't have enough uh, amount of speech, you will have to use suboptimal slices in some situations, and that will sound uh, bad. It, it, there will be noticeable, noticeable glitches in the audio. Um, the other problem is uh, with uh, scaling. Uh, something like uh, concatenative doesn't allow you to generalize across speakers or to do transfer learning because speakers, between speakers. If you have a corpus of speech for one speaker and you want to add another one, you need as much data as you needed for the first. The same applies for uh, expressive speech. If you want your speaker to be able to uh, produce speech in a range of emotions, you almost need to duplicate the whole data set for every one of the emotions that you want to say. On the other hand, it sounds pretty natural because you're using real speech, but it has these, these limitations. With parametric, uh, usually we can get away with, uh, with fewer, with less data, because we already have a model of, of, of how the, that is a good approximation of how the human vocal tract sounds. The problem here is usually that the speech that is produced, the quality of that speech is limited by the quality of the model that you have, and these are never perfect. So the speech ends up sound, sounding somewhat no, noisy, robotic, and unnatural. Um, here's where WaveNet came in. WaveNet is, can be seen as a parametric model on asteroids where everything, including the human vocal tract, is learned in an implicit neural network representation from the data that you have. Therefore, uh, your, the quality of your speech is no longer limited by the model that you have, but, but by the amount of data that you have, the quality of that data, and maybe the computing power you have to process that data. Uh, also, uh, this allows us first to produce speech that it's even of higher quality than unit selection for the same amount of data. Um, and it also allows you to do transfer learning across, uh, across expressive styles and across speakers. So if you have a large corpus for a language for one speaker, you don't need as much data to introduce a second speaker because the model can learn a lot about generalities of uh, how humans speak from the first data set, and just, you just need the sec a little bit of the second to fine tune to learn the peculiarities of another speaker. So this allows us to build more voices uh, and provide more, more, more speakers and more uh, emotional or expressive styles for cloud customers. Um, so demo time, we'll see if this works. So we can hear uh, some real examples from Google production systems. Um, so we're going to hear first the unit selection sample. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. So as you can he uh, hear, 
it's pretty natural. Uh, maybe it's a bit hard to tell it without uh, headphones, but there's a few glitches towards the end. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. Uh, and compare with that, WaveNet. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. Now, it's fast. So we don't have those glitches there. Uh, it may be a bit difficult to tell the difference with, without headphones. I spend, we spend a, lo a lot of time debugging these models with the headphones on. Uh, but there's a, 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 a real improvement in difference that you can, a, a real improvement in, in quality that you can measure um, in some ways that we'll see later. Uh, with respect to parametric, the difference is uh, much more clear. I think it will be evident even through, the, through the, these speakers. So this is one example of parametric. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. And WaveNet. A single WaveNet can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. So this now were, it's fast. <laughs> so these were two models on the strain on the same speaker on the same amount of data, and you can see that the WaveNet one sounds much more um, natural. In another language in Japanese. One Wavenet,のみで多数の異なる話者の音声波形を極めて正確にモデル化できます。今回、Wavenetによる音声波形生成を劇的に高速化しました。Alright. Now you know how to say Wavenet in Japanese. <laughs> um, see. Okay, so what is WaveNet? WaveNet, it's a, a neural network uh, that produces speech. Uh, the main thing that you have to know is that before, that before WaveNet came around, it, it was thought that it was not possible to generate speech, sample, audio sample by audio sample, uh, directly with a neural network, because the, the time dependence between, um, in, in, the, in the audio, uh, when you have a high sample rate, like 24,000 samples per second, is just too high for, most, for, for, for the model that you would have to train. So how we, did we do it? So what you need to, do, to know is that WaveNet is an autoregressive neural network with dilated convolutions. What does this mean? Uh, autoregressive means that every sample that you produce goes back as an input to the system to produce the next sample. Um, that way you create continuous sound that sounds natural. Uh, convolutional means that um, instead of connecting all neurons from one layer to all neurons from the next to the next, uh, you just connect each, each neuron to a couple or a small number of neurons from the previous layer, and you reuse the, the, the weights of that connection in all neurons that have the same relationship. That makes the model small enough to be, uh, for us to be able to lear learn it uh, efficiently. And finally, the, the, the secret sauce is the dilated part. Uh, what we do is that these connections that we reuse, as we go up through the layers of the neural network, we make the, the, the neurons that are connected to the one in the, in the following uh, layer, they are spaced apart farther and farther exponentially. Uh, so what, what this gives us is that the, the, um, the time range that, that can influence a sample grows exponentially with the number of layers instead of linearly. So keeping a small model with a moderate number of layers, we can get a, a very high receptive field that allows us to learn a model, the long-term the long uh, relationships that we need for the speech to sound natural. Um, so this was a very, uh, this paper uh, describing this work came, up, uh, came out in October 2016 and make a splash because it sounded much more natural than previous system but it was terribly slow, mostly due to the autoregressive nature of the model. Uh, you need to do, uh, you have to run a fairly complex neural network just to get one sample of audio, and you need to do that 24,000 times uh, to generate one second of audio. And um, there's a lot of optimization that you can do, but it's, it, was, it is not feasible with current hardware to get it fast enough um, for a real-time uh, text-to-speech system that usually needs to run orders of magnitude faster in real time. So what did we do? So uh, this motivated uh, a new line of research that resulted in a new paper 
published roughly a year later after the, the, the work was in production called Parallel WaveNet. So what we do is that we train, once we train the original WaveNet model, we use that as a teacher for a second neural network that is much faster. This neural network just takes in a vector of noise and transform it to sound like the speech that we want to sound, to, to, to generate. That uh, generated waveform is then passed to the already trained WaveNet model that scores how likely this is to be speech from a, a human being. And at the, or from the particular speaker that we want to replicate, actually. At the beginning, this network produces just random noise, but little, little by little, it learns how to produce audio that pleases the, the original WaveNet network, and that sounds, um, basically, it learns to imitate the, origi the original network. The good thing why we go this roundabout way is that this new, ne this new network, uh, it's feed forward, which means that in one single pass, you can generate all the utterance. You don't have to go sample by sample anymore. And it's not only faster, but it can be parallelized. So you can chop an utterance in many pieces, send it to different processors, different computers, and assemble it. And, and that's what allows us to get the latency that we, uh, that we need to make this available in production systems. Um, so this allowed us actually to increase the speed of WaveNet by three orders of magnitude. So we went from generating 20 milliseconds in one second, so significantly slower than real time, to generating 20 seconds of audio in just one second, so 20x real time. And that was enough for us to use this in production. Um, and even though we gave up on the autoregressive nature, and, and that can have an, an, an effect on quality, even this parallel wave net still closes 70% of the perceived naturalness gap between synthesized and real speech. Here you can see, these are most scores, which are basically we have blind tests in which we send audio, uh, audio samples to people and they score how natural they sound from one to five, five in the, the maximum. Usually you don't get a five because people always think that maybe you're trying to fool them. Uh, actually, real speech usually gets around 4.5, and we are able to push from the, the, the gap between synthetic and, and real set by, by 70%. And we believe that you know, further changes in processes are going to allow us soon to, to fully close that gap. Uh, thank you so much. With this, I will pass uh, to Dan Aharon, who is a PM in Google Cloud TTS. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Dan. I'm a product manager uh, in Cloud TTS, like we said, and a couple other products in Cloud AI. Um, so I want to uh, um, tell you a little bit more about Cloud Text-to-Speech. Um, so first, um, you know, this technology, um, what is it good for? So three main use cases we, we see it used. One is uh, in call centers for automated voice responses. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, IVRs today, interactive uh, voice response, they need to pre-record all the prompts uh, so that they can play them uh, when, when people call in. Uh, with, with TTS, they can now generate them automatically and they don't need to pre-record it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, they, they were forced to pre-record it because synthesized speech was, was not really that good up until now. But now, now it suddenly becomes good enough. And the other benefit is um, you, can, you have much more flexibility in language. So you can insert entities that change uh, instead of having one script that was recorded three months ago and then you can't deviate from it. Um, second thing, uh, similarly uh, in IoT, uh, if you want to talk to devices and have them talk back, uh, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very useful thing to have so that, that um, you know, you can have conversations with your users. And last but not least, media. Um, a lot of sort of written media can now find a new form in audio. And you're going to hear uh, from Diana a little bit uh, more about that in, in, in shortly. Um, so then uh, Cloud Text to Speech was introduced um, three or four months ago. Uh, it's part of our conversation group in the building blocks and, and part of our Cloud AI portfolio. So. Um, if you haven't already, definitely recommend you check out uh, some of the sessions for, for our other products. There's a lot of uh, really cool products in, in Cloud AI. Um, so Cloud TTS, as I mentioned, was introduced um, late in uh, uh, late March. 
And um, it's, it gives everyone the power to use the same TTS that Google does. Um, and and uh, that includes using uh, WaveNet voices. Um, you know, we uh, fortunately have the ability to run stuff on TPUs and other things, and we can produce a machine learning based uh, speech synthesis API at scale. Um, it's really easy to use. You're going to see that in a little bit. And it's pretty flexible. You can use text or SSML or do all these other things. Um, so a few new things we have for you today. Um, first, uh, WaveNet up until today has only been available in English US. Uh, we now have seven more languages that are available. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty big. It's been one of our biggest uh, requests from users. So we're very excited about that. Um, so it's now available in English, German, French, Japanese, Dutch, and Italian. French is not live yet. I think it'll be live maybe next week or, or, or pretty soon. Um, second thing is audio profiles, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, so this is now our full portfolio of, vo of voices. Um, uh, 14 total languages and variants, and um, there's 30 standard voices and 23 WaveNet voices. So across them, you get a you know, reasonably global uh, coverage with you know, a few pockets that are missing that we're working on, on, on covering. Um, OK, so the second thing we're introducing today is audio profiles. So um, up until now, text-to-speech produces a single WAV file. Uh, and then uh, as a developer, you can use that WAV file to play it anywhere you want to, whether that's in a kind of a tiny speaker, whether that's on headphones, or whether that's on a phone line or anywhere else. Um, what we've found is that the, the quality of the speaker or, or the uh, attributes of it can have a pretty big impact on the quality of the sound that comes out. Uh, and so this, um, y y if you want to aspire to get the best quality, you, you should actually have a different waveform that's sent to each type of speaker. So starting from today, you can actually uh, provide this audio profile choice. You can tell us whether it's going to be played on a, a handset or on a, on a, uh, a home uh, entertainment device or on, on a phone line. And then we'll do the, the proper adjustments. So here, for example, um, this is an example wave file and uh, how it looks like on a phone line. So you can see um, all of this area there on the left uh, and all of this uh, treble area on the right. You don't actually hear them on a phone line. So when you, when you try and play this wave file, it's going to sound distorted because you're missing a lot of the information that doesn't get carried across. Um, and Sorry, what we're doing with audio profiles is we're compressing it from the sides into the middle uh, for, for this example, for phone line. And so you can see now the waveform looks like this. And you get much more information there in the middle, uh, which, uh, which sounds better. And so e if I were to play it on my laptop, uh, it'll actually sound worse. But that same wave file, when you play it on a phone, it sounds better. Um, OK, so with that, let me. Um, go to the code lab and the demo. Let's, let's start from the demo first. Um, so text to speech. I'm just going to go to the news. Uh, let me make my screen bigger. Uh, let's uh, 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 Watson, beautiful. <laughs> let's choose this article. <laughs> Um, uh, and let's just copy this text and paste it into our new cloud to speech text to speech API. And I'm going to first uh, play a regular voice so you get a sense for how it sounds like. It's official. Carmelo Anthony is now a member of the Atlanta Hawks. For now, the three-team trade sending Anthony, Justin Anderson, and a 2022 lottery protected. So you can hear it's, it's a little robotic, right? Uh, now let's play the exact same thing in WaveNet. It's official. Carmelo Anthony is now a member of the Atlanta Hawks. For now, 
The three-team trade sending Anthony, Justin Anderson and a 2022 lottery protected first-round pick via OKC, to the Hawks, Dennis Schroeder and Timothy Luawu Kabarat to the Thunder, and Mike Muscala to the 76ers, is official. So you can see, um, it doesn't sound 100% human, but uh, if I weren't telling you that this is played by uh, speech synthesis, and if you were just listening to it, uh, I would have uh, imagined this is an NPR reporter or something like that. It's official, Car es Especially as you get to the second paragraph here. Carmelo Anthony is now a member of the Atlanta Hawks. For now, the three-team trade sending Anthony, Justin Anderson and a 2022 lottery protected first-round pick via OKC to the Hawks, Dennis Schroeder and Timothy Luawu Kabarat to the Thunder, and Mike Muscala to the 76ers, is official. It's official. Okay. So, uh, let's go to the code line. Oh, thank you. Um, so, what we're going to see next is uh, I'm going to show you how to take an audio file that I have here, and uh, we're going to transcribe it with speech to text. Then we're going to translate it to a different language, and then we're going to um, turn it into WaveNet and play it. Uh, so. Um, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, and I'm not a very good Python developer, so <laughs> work with me here, and uh, let, let's try and do it uh, together. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be able to get through it. Um, okay, so this is the, uh, this is the simple text-to-speech example that's on our website. Um, and so um, let's leave it for now. Let's come back to it. Um, let's add some code that does transcription. So um, this is the speech-to-text sample on our website. I'm going to copy over these import statements. So we already have argparse. Uh, so we just need IO. And then let's copy um, all of this. Um, okay. Uh, and instead of client, let's call it speech client. Um, okay. And now um, let's give it a path slash users then documents audio slash. Uh, going to play this file. Hi. I'd like to, oh, sorry, not this one, actually. I wanted this one. Welcome, everyone, to the Google Cloud Next session for text-to-speech. Hope you have a great day. OK. I'll put speaker HD, this one. OK. Uh, dot wave, um, and then we don't need sample rate house because it auto detects it. The language is ENUS. Uh, let's add punctuation. Uh, do we have punctuation here? No, it's probably in the beta snippets. Uh, punctuation, yeah, here it is. Enable punctuation equals true. So I'm going to paste it in here. Um, and um, let's also use the video model. I think you do that with model. Model equals video, yeah. Equals video. Um, are we using the beta speech or the formal one? Google Cloud. OK, we need this. So it gets the beta. So let me make sure that we're using that. Um, from Google Cloud, import speech of speech. OK, uh, great. So uh, now we have client recognize. And um, then it's 
um, printing the response. So it says this. Let's just run this and see that it's working correctly. Uh, and then here, linear, let's make this linear 16 and call it output.wave. Output.wave and, um, and then instead of this text, um, we can do alternative transcript. Okay, let, we can do that later. Let's, let's try and run this now. Um, so Python, let's go to the speech, uh, text-to-speech directory first. Python tran or synthesize text. Um, let's just give it a text. Okay. So um, has no model field. It's probably not using the beta. Um, we can probably do it without the model, but uh, let's just see if there's, oh, yeah, it's not, it should be speech client. Uh, let's try it again. If not, we can remove the model. Okay. Let's just remove the model. Maybe I have a typo there or something. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, skip that punctuation. Just use the stuff that's not in beta. Uh, okay. Line 48 here. Something's wrong with the audio. Version? Which version? Yeah, it's because I'm mixing. Um, I'm mixing the beta with the non-beta. So um, let's just uh, let's just use the regular one. We don't really need the beta. Okay, let's try this now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, welcome everyone to the Google Cloud Next session for Texas Speech. Hope you have a great day. Um, so we didn't, it's not, uh, it doesn't have punctuation, so that means the speech we're going to produce will not be um, as good, but that's, that's fine for now. Um, okay, uh, pick a language, guys. What are you feeling today from uh, one of the ones with WaveNet support, I guess? German. Okay, let's do German. So. Let's go to translate uh, Google Cloud. And let's look at the code sample here. Python, view on GitHub. Um, we'll add these imports. Uh, 
and then translate text. Where was it? Translate text. Here it is. Um, translate client and result. So, um, so we've done the recognition. Now, let's translate uh, translate client. We don't need this stuff. Let's translate it to uh, German. And the transcript equals um, you basically want response zero dot alternatives zero um, and then dot transcript. Hopefully I got that right. Let's just print it to be sure. Transcript. And transcript, and then translate the client, uh, translate text. So instead of text, we'll add transcript. Uh, this is translation result. And then uh, let's input that text here. OK. Oh, sorry, and text to speech. We should tell it that it's now doing German instead of English US. OK, let's try that. OK. <laughs> uh, cannot import name. I think I need to go and set up the cloud client. Uh, install, is that the command? Let's try that again. Whoops. Let's try the Python command again. Okay. Uh, response. Where is it? Oh, here it is. OK. So transcript equals response 0. Oh, no. It's response in result. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Response dot result 0. Let's try this again now. All the things that could go wrong in a live coding session. <laughs> uh, OK, so we got, we got it. Now there's just this translated text thing. Uh, so um, I think it's square brackets, right? Um, yeah, it's result translated text. So result translated text. Does anyone here speak German, by the way? How, how can we test if it's actually working? <laughs> yes, no? Yes, OK. Uh, OK, so this is the moment of truth, guys. Um, so we are in speech cloud client, and we should have Oh, text-to-speech cloud client. We should have this output wave file. Let's play it. Begrüßen alle in der Google Cloud nächste Sitzung für Text in Sprache hoffe, du hast einen schönen Tag. Is that right? More or less. Great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
We did it together with, with your help. So, you know, if I can do it with my poor pro Python programming skills, that really is a sign that anyone can. <laughs> so, uh, please uh, recommend that you play around with it, see what you can do. So with that, uh, let me welcome Diana. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for still being here. I appreciate that. I'm really excited to, to share with you some of the information um, about how we can use this amazing technology. So my name's Deanna Steele. I'm the CIO at a company called Ingram Content Group. Does anybody, has anybody heard of Ingram? Hands. Well, yes, I know some of you in the front have. Thank you. For the rest of you, it, um, Ingram Content Group, it, we connect books with readers. But what we are is we are the global content distributor for book-related content. And that includes physical books. That includes e-books and audiobooks. It also includes providing metadata to our customers, who tend to be retailers through all channels. And it includes ingesting publisher content, so publisher metadata and so forth. And because we have this ecosystem that relies on publishers and retailers, what we do is we provide analytics back to publishers. We, we deal with big publishing houses, the big guys, and we deal with small independent publishers as well as independent authors. Our customers are retailers, they're direct consumers, they're libraries, and they're educators. I'll go through this quickly. Um, three key themes we're seeing that make this technology really reasonable and relatable right now in the marketplace and where we think there's a huge opportunity. So first of all, the business trends have lent toward this, this technology really coming to fruition and really making a big difference. The opportunities we see span accessibility and other areas. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we'll deploy the technology. Sorry, I'll, I'll move here. Um, our innovation, so today, actually in 2017, we distributed 217 million audio and e-books around the world. Um, we print new books, or a new book every six seconds, and we print on our high-speed HP printers about 500 books an hour. Um, we span the globe, if we were to look at all the physical and digital content that we've produced, we'd span the globe uh, 1.2 times. The business trends. So what's happening is barriers to entry have fallen away. So several years ago, if you wanted to print your own book, your own memoir, or your own educational book, you would have had to write the outline. You would have had to shop it to either um, publishers or other agencies. And you would have had to do that numerous times and suffer rejection. Hopefully not a lot, but it happened. And the average lifespan to get a book accepted and published would have taken six to nine months. Today, it can take up to weeks. Um, we have worldwide distribution capabilities, so we, we support um, 28 facilities, either office or distribution center, and then have access to about 220 countries. Um, the business trends, so direct reach and discovery. We work with publishers on strategy, so ideation. We've dealt with publishers and retailers, retailers through channels for, for a long time, and that's our sweet spot. So we help publishers, especially small to independent publishers and then independent authors, find their way to direct distribution to content. We provide analytics, so we have advanced analytics platforms that allow data visualization and some degree of predictive analytics. Um, different topic, different time, but we're getting into data science in that area. And we have hundreds of publishers that rely on those platforms to understand how they manage and market their business. Um, we provide discoverability, so because we deal with publisher metadata, and you're all familiar with met metadata, we actually allow um, publishers to ingest their content and we help make recommendations to them as to how to make their books more marketable and discoverable, which is a big deal. If you think about publishers or even independent authors, very often they're not really aware of how to be successful in that business. They just know they want to produce that bestseller. We can help them do that. And then finally, the metadata that we ingest, we actually sell. So we've talked about monetizing data in previous sessions. We do monetize data, and that's a very important part of what we do. OK, so let's talk a little bit about business trends. Um, 181 million adults in the US read a book per year. Who here has read a physical book in the last year? OK, not surprising for this audience. And that kind of reflects what we've seen. So uh, the United States population includes about 326 million people. And of those, about 55% are adults. And of those, 181 million read. So it's, it's interesting. What we're seeing is that books in any format, about 74% of the population reads books. But what we heard and what we thought over time would happen is that ebook distribution would eclipse physical books. And we've seen that that hasn't happened. So what we have seen, though, is that the audiobook, uh, the, the listening to the audiobooks has increased significantly. And we're working with partners to ingest even more audiobook content. Why? For a few reasons. Um, business 
uh, business trends, including accessibility. So for us, accessibility is very important. When we think about how we provide access, whether through e or print, those are two key, of course, um, methods. But what we're seeing with, uh, with accessibility is that the US Census had um, about 9 million people identified in um, the, the United States alone that were either uh, hearing impaired or they were deaf. And uh, it's a challenge because only 39,000 Braille books had been printed. It's a, it's a very small percent of the population. And not everybody have, has access to Braille, nor do they all have access to, to voice readers. Um, what that means is the percentage of the population that potentially we can provide access to is significant. Not only when we think about hearing impaired, but also learning impaired. So people potentially with dyslexia who have a hard time reading, kids who need that information translated to them possibly, and also people who, for whom English is a second language and they want to be able to quickly put the audio and visual together. So we find that accessibility is key for us. I'm going to give you a, a snippet of what we believe to be really important and a potential um, for us to, to be able to make this text-to-speech resonate. There are a few things to think about here. First of all, obviously the success around text-to-speech, as you've heard, has to do with understandability and the ability to sound natural. In the past, when we've heard text-to-speech, we've heard very robotic uh, attempts, and you know, Bell Labs, and MIT have been working on, on this technology for decades. But what Google is doing is really uncovering that nat natural language sound. And so we're, we're very excited about that. Well, we believe that book discoverability is critical and that, in fact, Gartner says that, that about 30% of all search is going in 2020 is going to be done via voice. So it's going to be screenless. So that's really important as we think about enhancing book discoverability and so forth. The, the demo we're going to give you here is a snippet of a book uh, by Leif Enger. It's a book called Virgil Wander. Grove Atlantic will be publishing it in October of this year. Leif is a New York Times best-selling author, and so we think this book is going to do really well. So imagine you're driving, you hear an NPR segment about this book, and you think, I'd love to hear a segment. Before I go ahead and demo it for you, I'd like to give you a little background on, and context on the book. So the book is written about a gentleman living in the Midwest. He owns a cinema, a very old-fashioned cinema, and he still plays reel-to-reel -reel projection. So you'll hear something about being unspooled. His life is a little bit unspooled right now, and uh, what happens to him will demonstrate a little bit about how he picks it back up. We'll play you a snippet of the first part of the book. Ingram content. Hmm. Ingram content. All right, getting the test version of Ingram content. Hello, what would you like read to you? Virgil Wonder. Now I think the picture was unspooling all along and I just failed to notice. The obvious really isn't so, at least it wasn't to me, a Midwestern male cruising at medium altitude, aspiring vaguely to decency, contributing to PBS, moderate in all things including romantic forays, and doing unto others more or less reciprocally. If I were to pinpoint when the world began reorganizing itself, that is, when my seeing of it began to shift, it would be the day a stranger named Room blew into our bad luck town of Greenston, Minnesota, like a spark from the boreal gloom. It was also the day of my release from St. Luke's Hospital down in Duluth, so I was concussed and more than a little adrift. The previous week I'd driven up shore to a popular lookout to photograph a distant storm approaching over Lake Superior. It was a beautiful storm, self-contained as storms often are, hunched far out over the vast water like a blob of blue ink, but it stalled in the middle distance and time just slipped away. There's a picnic table up there where I've napped more than once. What woke me this time was the mischievous gale delivering autumn's first snow. I leaped behind the wheel as it came down in armloads. Highway 61 quickly grew rutted and slick. Maybe I was driving too fast. U2 was on the radio, mysterious ways, I seem to recall. Apparently my heartbroken Pontiac breached a safety barrier and made a long, lovely, some might say cinematic arc into the churning lake. Thank you. So we can go on to purchase the book.
Okay. We'll go ahead and, and move forward. Um, let me spend a little bit of time telling you about the technology. Um, the technology is a combination of Google's WaveNet and Ingram Content's core source application. Our core source system is our ebook content distribution system, and we house over 18 million titles in it. So there are two components, as you all know, around audio text-to-speech. And the first part is the ingestion. The second part is the distribution. So the way this works is that publishers, we ingest publishers' content. We do that today. Again, we do ebook distribution. We bring that book content into Ingram's core source and then push it out to the Google Cloud storage. The cloud function, so step four, includes three components. It includes translating it to a WAV file and then storing it in Google Cloud. This is for all new and changed content. If you think about it, book content doesn't change that much unless it's new or unless new additions come through. The cloud functions then pull that new content or the changed content through Cloud SQL into two of our technologies. One, Aereo, which is a tool that allows for written previews of books. Publishers house it on their sites and it allows them complete, to complete purchases. And the second is our iPage application, which is a business to business um, solution. The second part of it is also where the secret sauce happens, right? So the first part is translating that text to speech, the text to speech, and developing that, that wave file. The second part of it is when the, a sample is collected, much like the sample you just heard, we bring it in um, and the, into the Dialogflow Enterprise Edition, and the system parses that data, the, the title being the key, passes it through the cloud data flow into Cloud SQL, which then Dialogflow pulls that sample out of the Cloud SQL, passes it through to Cloud Functions, and then if transactions are to, ex to, be exist, or to exist, we pull it back into Google Express for the conclusion of the transaction. So we can bring it all the way through the sample and listening to that sample into the conclusion of a transaction. And we think that that's gonna be really powerful. So in conclusion, I don't wanna get between you and dessert or what have you. Um, we, we talked a little bit about some of the business trends and what's happening right now in the market. We talked a little bit about the changes from physical to E to audio. We talked about opportunities around accessibility and closing the loop between people who have needs and people who, and, and the systems and the technology today and what we can do, what Google's done with natural language. And we talked a little bit about the technology and how we support it. I think we have about 23 seconds, so I'll ask if there are any questions, either for any of us. All right, thank you.